Hi, my name is Dr. Emily Casanova, and I have been asked the question, did Neanderthals have autism? So the answer to this question is going to be a little bit complicated. First off, we know that certain nutritional deficiencies during pregnancy are definitely associated with an increased likelihood that a child may develop autism, so stuff like folate deficiency. We also know that most Paleolithic hunter-gatherer people underwent somewhat frequent nutritional hardships. We can see it in the enamel of their teeth, very much like you, you can read the health of a tree in its rings. And so for this reason alone, autism may well have occurred more frequently in all Paleolithic people, not just Neanderthals. Secondly, we know that Neanderthals experienced a pretty severe and prolonged genetic bottleneck as a result of small population numbers. And as we'd expect from this type of genetic isolation, DNA variants that are mildly harmful are more likely to spread through a very small population as if they're effectively neutral. The Neanderthal genome definitely shows an enrichment of this type of um, variation, what it's called uh, non-synonymous mutation. I'm not going to go into the science of that if you want to know more about it. It, I'm happy to explain it later, but it's basically a fancy way of saying uh, variations that are probably a bit harmful. Now, if these mutations are associated with a health-related condition, it's more often going to be something that's uh, a recessive condition. So that means that the person has to have inherited two copies of the mutation, one from mom and one from dad, in order to actually develop the condition. Now, we do know that some rare forms of autism are definitely recessive. So again, these types of autisms may well have been more prevalent in Neanderthals compared to early Homo sapiens. But honestly, right now, that is just pure, sheer conjecture. Now, when it comes to Neanderthal-derived DNA in modern human genomes, so in us, we're essentially kind of hybrids, right? Most of the genetic effects that we're probably going to be seeing are from a mismatch between a D DNA variant and then the background genome. Now, mind you, that does not necessarily mean that that mismatch is always bad. Uh, that's really more of a human construct, something I like to think of as more of akin to a Campbell's soup label. Now, given the patterns that we see in autism today, instead I would expect that probably a lot of these variants are more like a double-edged sword. Um, there may be some mismatch, but some of the things that they provide for, there may be a mix of both good and bad. So, um, for instance, as an example, we do know that there are a number of medical conditions that are more likely to co-occur with autism, stuff like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and um, polycystic ovary syndrome and stuff that ultimately may affect overall health as well as potential potentially fertility. Um, if you target fertility, you're definitely going to affect whether that person's genes get passed on, right? So um, basically, uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword, like I said. But the other side of that, we may see things associated with autism like creativity and savant-like skills and maybe even high intelligence uh, that may be conferring some of that benefit or that positive selection. So again, I wouldn't be surprised uh, that if some of these abilities are helping us to retain some of these variants, these Neanderthal variants that um, are slowly kind of getting weeded out of the genome, but nevertheless are still sort of being retained possibly for some of these reasons. So that's a, a complicated answer to um, what maybe seemed like a very simple question, uh, but thank you for asking, and I look forward to uh, responding to some more questions. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to like and subscribe for more. We have plenty of videos and ideas coming on this topic, and if you want more, make sure to share this around because there's plenty to come.